So this is what the control panel looks at your view. I will start with the field at the bottom first. This is a text field where you can write your questions. I will welcome these questions because it's much easier for me to post them afterwards to the speaker. I have the experience that spoken questions are a bit difficult due to connectivity and due to the quality of the audio we sometimes have. So I would invite you to use this tool if you have questions. When you post it, I will get them, I can read them at once and can forward them to the speaker afterwards. This orange arrow is there to minimize the panel so it won't disturb the screen. This is the icon for having a full screen. By using this icon, you can virtually raise your hand. I can see in the attendees list if you have rose in your hand and I can then react to your raised hand. This is the symbol for the micro. All micros of attendees are muted at the moment and please keep them muted because we would have disturbing sounds otherwise. Yes, all micros are muted, as I already said, and this session will also be recorded and made available afterwards on the Foodstar website. So some words about the Foodstar project. EU Foodstar is the abbreviation for the European Food Studies and Training Alliance. It's an Erasmus Plus Knowledge Alliance project and we are doing it since January 2015. What is the vision of the project? In universities, the knowledge is passed on to students through food studies. The approach of universities is rather a research view and a rather research approach. On the other side, there is food industry who has applied knowledge, need of applied knowledge, and is more on the practical basis. Universities, as I already said, have a focus on research and publication. In food industry, it's much about IPR, on practical applications, and time constraints are also very important in this uh, regard. So there is a gap between the theoretical and the practical approach, and the vision of Foodster is to close this gap. And how do we want to reach this? We want to establish long-term partnerships on European level and have clear, simple goals and not too high expectations. So we try to bring yes, theory and practice together, which is not always so easy, but we try to do it, among others, by these webinars, that which you now attend one of them. The Foodstar project uh, encompasses seven universities, three food companies and 11 multipliers and training providers in the European countries depicted here. The consortium consists of these universities located in Austria, France, Portugal, Germany, the UK and Italy. Food companies involved are Frulact and GB Foods and also Nestle. Multipliers and training providers with different target groups are also involved. LVA, for example, provides training for food industry in Austria, but we have also Actia from France, Federal Alimentare from, Ital from Italy, Anja from France, FIAP from Spain, Seft from Greece, FIPA from Portugal. Associated partners are the EVA Food Association, a university and teachers network, EFOST, SPES and EROICA. During the European Foodstar project, we will establish food, Foodstar centers. This will involve physical hubs this, uh, in different regions, and we want to 
maintain sustainable collaborations beyond the end of the project and keep key stakeholders involved. If you have suggestions for us, if you want to know more about the Foodster project, please send your suggestions to office at iseki-foodnet. So thank you for your attention for the European Foodster project. Now it is time to turn our attention to Mr. Joao Goncalves. Apologies for wrong pronunciation. He is our today's lecturer and has vast experience with project management on different levels, from universities and on uh, also local and uh, business uh, level. You are an urban and regional planning expert from the University of Aveiro and today we will be informed about innovation possibilities in the uh, fish sector. So I would, give to, I would like to give the floor to you. This means that I make you presenter. Thank you, Christine. Hi. I just have some problems to make you presenter, but now you should get... Yeah. Yes, the information that you can present. Let me know if you can see it. Yes, wonderful. Okay. So, welcome to a webinar dedicated to the theme Support of Entrepreneurship and Enhancing of Competitiveness in the Fish Sector. So, basically, this, uh, this presentation was prepared under the Trafoon project, uh, an European project funded by the Seventh Research and development framework of the European Commission. Uh, the project had already ended, it, it lasted for 36 months and uh, it addressed the needs of SMEs in the value chain of four product groups in the agro-food sector. One of them was fish and this is why we did this, this, uh, this work. So Trafun was a network of research institutions, technology transfer agencies and SME associations uh, with the aim to secure the knowledge, knowledge transfer and implementation of already existing innovations regarding traditional foods to SMEs. So to transfer innovation and technology to SMEs uh, through this network of institutions. There were uh, a lot of partners involved in the consortium. We had 29 partners ranging from universities, research institutions, technology transfer agencies, SME associations and European Food Industry Association. These are the, the whole partners that were involved in this consortium. The results of the projects as you would expect were varied but uh, I would like to mention the, uh, an inventory of needs of SMEs in the traditional food sectors. Uh, associated 55 training workshops in 13 European countries. Uh, a strategic uh, research and innovation agenda handed to the European Commission in the end of the project. And uh, as you can see in the slide, uh, a consumer oriented book containing information about traditional dishes from Trafoon uh, food categories, the four, the, the, the four icons that you see there, and uh, some recipes destined to raise awareness and promote the, the products. The, these were recipes throughout Europe, including my country, Portugal. All, all this information is, is still available in the Trafoon website, trafoon.eu, and is available in English, German, and French. We have there, if you would like to see it, a uh, Trafoon information uh, shop where all the resources that we produced are, are carefully uh, structured and available for consultation. Um, so, uh, although Trafoon has come to the close, this, this, uh, we had the intention of keep, keeping the, the dissemination going. So we, we, this is the reason why we, we are still doing, doing this presentation with European Food Star. 
just a brief mention of my own organization that participation participated in the Trifun project. Uh, it's, it's called Sociedade Portuguesa de Inovação. It's a consultancy for Portugal, uh, an international firm with offices in Portugal, Spain, United States, China, Brussels, and other operations in other countries. Uh, basically, our mission is the management of projects that foster innovation, entrepreneurship, uh, promote international opportunities and strategic partnerships. And through our experience, we were engaged in the Trifund project in dealing more closely with SMEs and in researching and translating practices of innovation that companies in the food sector could take on and implement in their own specific situations to good avail. So, uh, this is the outline of my presentation today. I shall begin by a very brief introduction to the prospects for aquaculture in the fish sector. I will then pass uh, to a, a tool uh, of market assessment. And thirdly, I shall glance a bit about the, the marketing tools that are available to us to, to successfully place a product in the market. I shall uh, just discuss the, the most common use tool for, for marketing today, the 7P of marketing. I shall end with a case study that uh, uh, summar summarizes all the, the, the information that I, I, I shall uh, transmit. So regarding the current situation and future uh, uh, prospects for aquaculture in the fish sector. Well, this, this information we took mainly from the, the Fish to 2013 FAO and World Bank report, which offers a global overview and, and makes projections of fish supply and demand by the year 2030. Based on trends in each country for the production of captured fisheries and aquaculture, and those for the consumption of fish, the, the, the World Bank's impact model uh, makes projections of global fish supply and demand to this year. And the first conclusion that we took is that fish is a highly traded product in interna international markets. And according to these organizations, 38% of fish produced around the world was exported. Even developing countries from Africa, from Asia, from South America, are well integrated in this global seafood trade. And the, the flow from these countries to the more developed countries has ever been increasing. Therefore, it is important to understand, this is the reason I placed this, this chapter of the, in the presentation, it is important to understand the global links of supply and demand of fish to discuss the production, the selling and the consumption of fish in a given country or region like the European. So, basically, the aquaculture share in global supply will expand to the point where it reaches an equal amount of the, the fish capture by 2030. Aquaculture is projected to supply over 60% of, of fish destined for human consumption. 80% of the fish produced globally is consumed by people as food and it is, this is not expected to change into 2030. So the annual per capita fish consumption is projected to reach 18 kilograms per person in 2030. The trend is, however, diverse across regions. It will hold in Europe and Central Asia, and it will grow uh, quite uh, in the South Asia. These are the, the main consu consu consumers of global fish. The prices of all fish and fish products are projected to increase between 2010 and 2013. Prices of uh, fish meal and fish oil will rise substantially more than those of fish for direct consumption. So if you add value to the to the, the, the the product of the sea, the, it will get more uh, expensive. About 20% of total fish produced is used for fish meal and fish oil production in, in the current year, 
and this will remain unchanged until 2030. The importance of aquaculture in fish mill use has grown substantially. So basically aquaculture is used for, for uh, as a meal for other species of, uh, of animals, as so poultry and swine animals. Latin and Caribbean countries account for 40% of fish production, while China accounts for 40% of consumption. China is the main uh, consumer of fish. Also, the projected growth of aquaculture is much faster than the project projected growth in fish meal use in aquaculture. What basically this means is that there is, has been a decline in the feed conversion ratio how, how much fish is produced per unit of fish meal use, which translates to increased efficiency in uh, its use. Uh, in summary, it is clear that aquaculture will continue to fill the growing supply demand gap in the face of a rising fish demand and relatively stable capture fisheries. Will also, uh, may I add, worryingly decreasing sea stocks. While total fish supply will likely be equally split between capture and aquaculture by 2030, the model predicts that 62% of fish, food fish will come from aquaculture. Beyond that year, it is likely that aquaculture will dominate fish supply. So, Investments in aquaculture must be thoughtfully undertaken with consideration of the entire value chain because they will influence all the value chain. And of course, to, to feed this, this increasing demand, further technological innovation are expected in aquaculture feeds, genetics and breeding, disease management, product processing, and the issue that brings us to this webinar, marketing and distribution. So in the following chapter, I shall concentrate in the marketing aspects of innovation. So the, the main question here is if a producer wants to, to invest in new products, in new services, in, in, the, in agriculture, in the fish sector, where can he start? How do we introduce new products of fish in the market? For example, in the cases that were very particular of the Trifoon project, countries such as the Europe, Eastern European countries that are not used to, to, to eat fish, how can we introduce the habit of eating fish in such countries? Well, the, the answer lies in the market itself. The producer and the seller must know in detail the potential consumers and their preferences. And, we, and you can find valuable information about the way we can and should provide fish products to them by their own information, by querying them. And the kind of information that we want to, to know is not only what kind of food they want, but also about packaging, labeling, channels, uh, uh, joining uh, different products in the same product. And there is a methodology called new product development that may help us in this task, especially, and we are going to, to focus on one of its main components, market assessment. This is basically the, the whole uh, life cycle of the new product development tools. We're just going to talk about the, the, the phase one and phase two that you see there. Identification of latent customer, customer needs and the uh, concepts and ideas generation. And the purpose is to uh, uh, give an example of a tool that you can use to, to diversify your portfolio of products or fish products. So basically, uh, if you want to know what are the requirements of a group of customers, you have to select a, 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 a sample of them. And this will be the starting point to define the concept of the winning product. So a group of customers to listen should be identified at the outset. Namely, 
what we are talking about, direct customers or end users, direct customer of the business or the end users of the products, of course. And uh, we talk about current customers, potential and former clients, satisfied or dissatisfied customers, meet consumers, they can change their, their preference. And also different types of clients, taking market trends into account. I mean, vegetarians, flexitarians, food travelers, all these people that uh, eat food and could eat food, uh, fish in the future, even vegetarians, who knows. And also we would like to hear influences and stakeholders, people connected to the sector that have an idea what future trends may be, especially the, the opinion makers that have the ability to anticipate uh, uh, coming, coming uh, trends. Of course, if you want to listen to, to what the people have to say, what the, the prospective, current and prospective consumers have to say about this issue, uh, we can't hear every one of them. So, uh, a number, typically a number between 20 and 30, it highly depends on the universe of consumers, what, what product we are talking about, of course, but we can consider in our experience that the 20 and 30 number is fine. Uh, the, the methodology just states that you should do as many interviews until a new interview does not provide further requirements. This is the, the, the point of the, the, this graphic over there, the chart. So you should prepare to, to for value for money for your, your interview time. You should prepare different types of scripts for the interviews, one for each type of customers to listen. Thus, you should ask specific questions to each player regarding its uh, intended purchase or use of the, the fish product. So we're talking about what problems have you experienced regarding the, the product, what, uh, what do you think of when you chose the, that, that product, what new features would you like to see in it, and which image does the, the buying the product uh, uh, entail. And these are kinds of different questions uh, uh, aggregated by different stakeholders. Of course, the, the various interviews should be transcribed and analyzed thoroughly in order to extract from them the voice of the customer. This is what you are trying to reach, to achieve, the voice of the customer, of the mean customer, which expresses their manifest or latent needs or desires. The need analysis resulting from interviews to different types of consumers can be handled separately. Uh, it, it is interesting to hear each client or consumer individually so that you can reflect what they are, they are saying about the product. After the extraction of the customer voice, you need to extract key points. However, it is necessary to take into account the fact that the requirements must be clear, specific, and defined in space and not in post solutions. So expressions such as should, not, must, and should be avoided. Uh, this is an example of some information, categorization of the information from uh, interviews. So there is uh, some, someone that says that buying fish is an opportunity to, to learn something about the fish. And then there is an image of the book and uh, you have to, to write down the key points and the requirements to the product that those, those voices entail. Uh, for the analysis of this data, that is normally a huge amount of data, we have specific tools that I would like to, to showcase to you. The main one that we use usually is the Kano questionnaire, which is a method to be used in order to obtain a proper categorization of customer requirements. So we have a whole text of data with very important information for you, and this is a way that you can structure uh, and eventually lead to new requirements to, to your products. The Kano model is based 
on three premises that customer satisfaction with products features depend on the level of functionality that features can be classified into four categories that we will see in a minute and that you can determine how customers feel through a questionnaire so it's you can uh, not only qualitative information but you can translate it into a quantitative scale we'll go over each one of them individually <laughs> so the first uh, axis of, of analysis is the main goal of the when a customer buys a product which is satisfaction so the Kano model proposes a dimension that goes from total satisfaction or, or we can call delight or excitement to total dissatisfaction or frustration by the product. This is just the value that the, the customer places in the product. And you can see the scale, the Kano model scale that we currently use. And then there is the other axis which is functionality. Besides uh, me being uh, happy about the satisfied with the product the product must be, must do what we have bought it for so functionality it represents um, the feature that the customer shall get how well we've implemented it how much we've invested in its development so it's basically from no functionality to the best functionality possible <clears throat> so, the Kano model, we can classify the features into four categories, depending on how customers react to the provided level of functionality. You can see the, the graphic representation of the different responses that we can get from customers. The first one you see in yellow is called performance. So, some product features behave as we might intuitively think that satisfaction works. The more we provide, the more satisfied our customers become. It's a proportional relation between functionality and satisfaction. These features are usually called one-dimensional attributes. Just we, we eat more of them, we are happier. Let me give an example, like when we buy a car, the amount of miles or kilometers that we do with the, the gasoline or the diesel that we put in the tank is a performance attribute or the internet connection speed or a laptop battery life. The other uh, consideration are must be features in a product and these features are simply expected by customers. If the product doesn't have them, we just consider them incomplete or they're not the product that we expected. These are also called basic expectations. So we need to have them, this is why we, we bought the product, but that won't make us more satisfied. It just makes us dissatisfied if they are not present. So for example, we expect fish to have uh, some amount of meat inside, we expect our phones to be able to make calls, we expect a hotel room to have running water and a bed, etc. Then there is also, there is also the attractive category and this uh, is a bit different. This is unexpected features. They're also called delighters. Uh, but the term attractive is preferable because it is also a scale as you can see in the blue line there in the in the graphic the the best example that we we can find is the the, the iPhone the, the first time that it appeared that the iPhone appeared in the market it was completely uh, uh, new we are not expecting such a fluid touch screen screen interface and, and we were really experiencing something entirely innovative. And the graphically is also interesting because uh, with some level of functionality it leads to increased satisfaction but then uh, up to a point because beyond that certain point 
there is no more functionality and we are just experiencing more satisfaction for no function. And then finally, in the black, in the, the, the X axis, there are also the features that are completely indifferent for us. So this is an example uh, translated to the fish sector. So of course, uh, functional features in, the, in fish would be food safety and everything connected with food risk technology, anti-contamination technologies, uh, and also a performance uh, feature would have anything to do with quality, and also uh, attractive features would, uh, would be involved with the novel and functional fish foods, like a radical innovation in the way we sell or consume fish. So, once we have this, this information, you, you, you have to have another group, well, you will have to ask them. So, there was a group of people who responded this, and we made this list of features. And then we will ask two different kinds of questions. One asks the customers how they feel if they had the feature identified previously. And the other one asks how they feel if they did not have the feature. Just out of curiosity, the first question is called a functional form, and the second one is called a dysfunctional form. And they are not open-ended questions. As you can see there, you can only, you only have five possible answers. You either like it, you either ex expect it, you are, uh, you are neutral towards it, you can tolerate it, or you really dislike it. And this is an example of the fish product and the echo label. We would, could ask people, so if there, the fish was certified, how would you feel? And there is the scale of answers possible. After asking your prospective customers these two questions and getting their answers, the next step would be to categorize each feature. And we do this through an evaluation table that combines the functional and dysfunctional answers in each row and column. There are codes there and I shall explain them in detail. Given the fact that we're asking from both sides of the question, we'll also be able to tell if something was not fully understood and what we propose is actually the feature that was proposed is actually the contrary, the opposite of what they want. So basically if someone says she dislikes the functional version and likes the dysfunctional version, this person is clearly not interested in what they were offering and that perhaps actually wants the opposite. This new category is called reverse, and it's the R that you see in the table there. Also, you can get conflicting answers. So if you like, if you, if there is an answer to like the, the affirmative question and dislike the, the negative question, that is a questionable answer. Obviously, that person didn't understand what was asked, or she's probably wrong. About, uh, about the answer. And then the most interesting part are the categories that I mentioned previously. First of all, the performance features, which are the most straightforward uh, feature to position. They are the ones where customers like having them and dislike not having them. So it's a linear, more is better relation. And this is easily identified in the answers. And then there are also the must-be features. This product must have this feature X or this feature Y. So customers obviously can go from tolerating to expecting to have the feature. This is the M in the table there. Attractive features are most interesting and are found when a customer likes having a feature that is not expected to it, an unexpected feature. It's very uh, pleasant to them. And also we have the indifferent features. These occur for any 
I'm neutral or I can tolerate it answer for either the functional or dysfunctional question. This is the, the I that is in the table. Of course, you don't need to memorize all this categorization. The NPD model manual will provide you with all this categorization and you just need to, to know how to analyze the data that you have from the respondents. So how do you use this, this, all this data? Well, the simplest way is to go through the Kano results and you should reach the table that is there. The goal is to, to see if feature one, two or three are interesting features. Are they attractive features? Are they must have features or are, or they enhance performance of the products? So the, the, the method is, is like this, the Kano model method. You should divide the response by the demographic segmentation, categorize each response answer using the evaluation table, the, the former slide, count the total responses in each category relating to each feature, as you see in that table there, feature one, total 15, which reached the final category of M, or, or it's a must-have feature, and also, if you have close results or ties, you should uh, use the, this table to, to prioritize them. Left, left most wins, or for example, a must be is more important than a performance and more important than attractive feature, of course. So this is the table that the, this, this, this construction will end up. So uh, once classified all customer requirements, respecting the ranking, attention must be paid to attractive performance and must be features. So what should our product do? It should obey the mandatory requirements, the must be, must have requirements, so this product must have these features. It, the, the company strategy, the product strategy should strive to keep the dimensional requirements, the dimensional uh, the performance features competitive. So, for example, the, the car mileage that I just mentioned, the, the company strategy should be to increase the gas mileage of the, the gasoline of the car. And also, finally, to enchant the customer with attractive requirements. One of the, the biggest marketing tools of the, the iPhone in the, the, the first years were the attractive uh, features that were presented in the first iPhone. So the, the, the company idea, conceptualization was heavily dependent on, on uh, taking advantage of that, those attractive requirements. You can also divide the Kano questionnaires in two depending on the public. So if you want to hear the opinion of vendors, you should do one questionnaire and the other for the users or influencers. Of course, for the users and influencers, there should be a bigger number of questionnaires to have a, a bigger sample because it's, it's a bigger universe. So once we have all this information about what features are valid in the product, what requirements are, are, are valid by the customer, the following step of the new product development tools uh, follows. So in this goal is to achieve ideas that uh, uh, approach the product requirements that the customers have stated. And for this you, ha you can ha involve external elements to the company and this we call open innovation. So bring customers, bring other, uh, uh, your own uh, corporate uh, collaborators, workers and think about ways to satisfy the, the demands of the public. Why we think this is important to involve other elements external to the company? Well, because mostly we've seen that um, a lot of companies, they, they pursue a phenomenon called satisficing. And this is a process of conforming to early solutions to a problem or just one solution. To counter this type of behavior, one should seek to create an enabling environment 
inside the company and outside by using some tools of creativity, which I shall not go in this presentation. From this process, it should be possible to collect a fairly broad set of ideas, which must later be filtered and selected. And in the end, and this is the, 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 the goal of this, these two tables, to answer the product requirements of the, the consumers. And uh, now I shall go into the next chapter of this presentation, which is the, the market aspect. So we have an idea, we, we follow we follow all the, the steps, we listen to the consumers, we all have a, lot, a bunch of ideas that we filtered according to our company and product strategy, and now it's the product launch. So basically the product launch is an expensive and risky and usually at least well-managed part of the overall product development process. Uh, the literature generally describes launch strategy as including a strategic and a tactical launch decisions. A strategic launch decisions are not the scope of this webinar, they are uh, like a business plan, a product development plan, a competitive strategy, a firm strategy. They are uh, the very long-term tools and they're also the, the marketing decision, the tactical decisions, which are more, uh, let's say, medium, but also short-term decisions. And they pertain how do we launch and are easily, more easily changeable in the development cycle. So I shall talk, talk a bit about the options of marketing the product that we, we developed uh, following the new development product uh, methodology. So what is marketing? Uh, marketing is not promotion, it's actually a strategy of, of selling your products, that's basically it, and it includes uh, manifold activities. Of course, you also have to do uh, homework. First of all, you need to study the underlying market beyond consumer expectations. So beyond the work that you did to listen to them, there is also the question of the situation, the barriers, problems of placing your product in the market. And also, you can develop some likely developed scenarios so that you can prepare for any unforeseen situation. Second, you have to think your goals for the product. What is the market share that the companies aim to achieve? Of course, if you had the, done the NPD tool that we just discussed, all this work then on this slide, the consumer behavior and the purchase behavior will, will be more or less answered. And then there is the question of the competition. So you have to think who are your competitors how have they been behaving in the market? What brands, brands do they use? Do they, they produce the fish, shall we say, or just sell it? And what marketing tools are they using? So marketing is an essential component and it requires a plan and this leads us to the seven P's of marketing. Product, price, promotion, place, packaging, positioning and people. This is the most common formula nowadays for successful marketing. So, considering a company that sells fish, aquacultural fish, the product itself is the fish, the fish in kilograms as a price, of course, the distribution company and the retailer supermarket are the place, promotion is the business of communicating with the customer, consumer, the customer, Packaging is not only the package, but also all the visual elements related to the company. For example, a fish wrapped in cellophane, the label, the colors, the place in the supermarket where, where, it, is, where it is holding. Positioning is how the customer thinks about the product, which essentially is not, does not correspond entirely to the, the way that the company perceives the product. And most importantly, the people, 
the ones that are actually producing, delivering, distributing the, the service and selling the, the product to, to, to customers. So just some brief pointers on the seven P's of marketing or on each issue. Regarding the, the, the product, we, we should ask critical questions constantly about is my current product or mix of products appropriate and suitable for the market and the customers today? The price, the question that we should ask is to continually examine and re-examine the prices of other products and services uh, relevant or similar to ours and essentially think about promotions or other strategies to, to, to sell your product. Regarding promotion, uh, it includes all the ways you tell your customers about your products or services. So small changes in the way you promote and sell your products can lead to dramatic changes in your results. About the place, we should develop the habit of reviewing and reflecting upon the exact location where the customer meets the salesperson or where the product is placed in the store or the supermarket. About the packaging, we should, uh, it's a good practice to stand back and look at every visual element in the packaging. As a client, what you think would you buy in the product? Is that, does that catch, catch your eyes more than the others? The position means basically to think continually about how you are positioned in the hearts and minds of your customer and the question what other people think about not only the product but the company and finally the matter of people uh, the good practice would be to think in terms of the people inside and outside of business who are responsible for every element of your sales and marketing strategy and activities are they happy do they believe in the product would they use or consume the fish that you are selling, examples like this. To finish with my presentation, I I'm going to present just one uh, that we believe it was a good practice in the development of new products that followed more than these two tools that are presented in this webinar. So it was a, it is a small a Portuguese company, a very new. Portuguese company devoted to the research and production of seaweed and seaweed based products and well they had this idea they thought it was uh, completely differentiating in the market but the problem is that seaweed is a product that the Portuguese and European are, are not accustomed to so um, after some market research they used a creative novel approach and came up with the idea of incorporating seaweed into typical Portuguese dishes, such as codfish. Uh, so they contacted other companies interested in doing a joint venture. They, they also had to choose which seaweed was best suited to the liking of the consumers to guarantee the quality of the wholesome meal and the packaging. Uh, this was the result in the, the image. So the, the owner said to us that the strategy is not only to, to, to sell seaweed products, but also to enrich other products that are already produced with the seaweed to uh, add value by a product that is not usually seen in the market, uh, in the supermarkets today. So this concludes my presentation. I hope I, I, I obey the 30 minutes that I had in, in store. I think I exceeded a bit. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm here to answer. I'm glad to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Joao. I think this was a really complete and concise presentation and no problem with some minutes that might be have been a bit longer than 30 minutes. So. I'm asking the audience too if there are any questions. I have no raised hand and no posted questions so far.
let just me just say that um, yeah. next Thursday uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to hold a new webinar where I should present the um, a list of eight practices more than this seaweed example that I've just uh, discussed and I shall have the opportunity to to talk in detail how, how what methods it, uh, each uh, company followed. If you, mm -hmm. in case anyone is interested, you can join the, the same webinar on Thursday. The same webinar on Thursday, okay. Yeah. And we have also recorded this webinar and it is possible to get back to it via the Foodstar website, which you should see now on your screen. In this point, events and webinars, they can back, come back to all the webinars that were already held during the Foodster project and you have also a schedule for the coming webinars. So since the audience does not have any questions, I may thank you very much, Joao, for giving us your lecture. It was very interesting and also the cross-linking to Trafoon was very nice to have. And we are now informed about fish products and innovation possibilities and let's see what our attendants can make out of this new knowledge. Okay, thanks thank very, very much. much. Good afternoon to the audience. I may thank you very much for your attendance. Uh, it is possible, as I said already, to get back to the Foodster website for the recording of the webinar, also for the presentation of the webinar. And I wish you a pleasant evening. Goodbye. Goodbye.